Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. As we sit at the front of 2024, there's a lot we're paying attention to. What can a real estate investor expect this year? Well, today we'll talk about what we're watching in the world, the economy, and the real estate sectors in 2024. And we've got a great guest on the Real Estate Guys radio program. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms, and with me, as usual, our co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. There are so many differing opinions about where we're headed this year and what's going to happen and the things that affect real estate investors. And, you know, we always have to pay attention to the big picture. That's one of the distinctions, I think, of our show is we don't just talk in the weeds about real estate and markets and strategies but we lift our head out of the weeds and also consider the bigger picture. And I think that's going to be super important this year because one, everything has changed with the quick increase in interest rates that we've witnessed with what's happening uh, in all kinds of areas of housing, our unbelievably constricted inventory. And at the same time, it's an election year. There's going to be a lot to watch this year. There is, and it's probably going to be one of the most exciting election cycles and economic cycles to be a part of because there's so many things that are very, very unprecedented. We recently had uh, the House Ways and Means Committee put forth a bill where they're talking about uh, trying to advance the idea of not only returning 100% bonus depreciation for real estate investors, but making it retroactive, which means that if you bought a property in 2023 and got 80% bonus depreciation, you would be looking at 100. So that gives you a little bit of insight. Maybe it was a bipartisan bill into the direction things might go. Obviously, there's no guarantees, but policies do matter. And this is a political year. And so it's going to be interesting to see which policies are put forth and which policies actually get elected or policymakers get elected and whether those policies are going to be forthcoming. And I think that's one big part of it. The other thing, obviously, is the Fed having gone from a very restrictive policy of raising interest rates aggressively, created all kinds of damage and uh, loss of equity and all kinds of real estate, REITs in trouble, mortgages in trouble, CRE is maybe threatening the entire financial system. Stocks are booming in anticipation of the Fed pivot. And they came out later and said, hey guys, we are thinking maybe we've got it where we want and we're gonna take our foot off of the throat of the economy and see if we can come in for a soft landing. Will they do it? I don't know, history says they won't, but maybe they will. So we're just watching all of this stuff and talking to all of our very smart friends to see what they think and then putting all that in a blender and trying to figure out what we think. Yeah, you know, the stock market's a fun example because every day you can find somebody saying, hey, run for the hills, sell all your stuff. Why somebody else is saying, oh no, this is going to be going on forever, pile in. And it's interesting, especially because real estate investors and stock investors often think differently. Our premise is before you're a real estate investor, you're an investor and you should be looking at the markets and what we're doing. But especially in the stock market because it moves so quick, you can kind of gauge that investor sentiment, if you will. We hit a couple of highs this last week, right? S&P all-time high, uh, Dow Jones all-time high. Either that says, hey, we're nearing the top or, hey, let's get on the roller coaster. 
Well, I think there's a couple of things there regarding the stock market, because I'm actually just working on a piece right now and I've been doing some research. Uh, the challenge that you've got with those valuations is they're based on comparative sampling. So only a few stocks need to trade and only a few stocks of those few issues need to trade highly. And then there's this plunge protection team that was created back in 1987. It's not the technical name. I think it's called the President's Working Group. But basically, it's the government stepping in and manipulating the stock market to the upside. And if you can manipulate a few stocks, you can create faux wealth where people have 401k statements and their stock brokerage statements feeling like, hey, my stock's worth all this. Well, you put that in and say, okay, well, now we've got maybe a weakening economy. They've been revising the jobs report down uh, and that the mix itself is heavily government and not really manufacturing, and that doesn't really bode well for a strong economy. I think a lot of this boom in the stock market of late is the Fed's pivot and the anticipation of cheaper money. Uh, we're going to see. That's what we're going to find out here in 2024. That's one of the things we're paying attention to. And then in all of that, I just read an article the other day that Goldman Sachs got caught again advocating to their investors to buy at the same time they're on the other side of the trade selling. And so the market hits an all-time high. People pile in because a big-name company is saying buy, and they're on the other side of that selling. And, you know, if the idea is buy low, sell high, and you're buying when it's high, which side of the trade are you on? Probably not the right side. So these are all things that I think Main Street investors need to pay attention to, whether they're in it or not, because the stock market does create a faux wealth effect, just like real estate equity does. And then investors are more willing to spend on credit, believing they're kind of spending against the strength of their balance sheet. The challenge that I think some of the naysayers or the doomsayers say is that those valuations on those balance sheets aren't necessarily as resilient uh, as you probably need them to be. And they certainly won't be as resilient as those monthly payments that you obligate yourself to do when you go into debt on the strength of your balance sheet. So these are things that investors need to be paying attention to. And then when you think about your investment strategy, are you going to invest for buy low, sell high? Are you going to count on favorable circumstances to rise all ships so that you end up with equity? Or are you going to create equity that's derived from income? Or are you going to invest directly for the income itself? And that's all part of your investment philosophy. Here we are at the beginning of the year. Good time to be thinking a little bit about who you are as an investor, what it is you're really investing in, and have that direct your decisions to say yes or no, or the strategy and tactics you use to execute your plan. It should be no surprise on a show called The Real Estate Guys that we favor real estate, but we do look at the other types of marketplaces. You know, we watch the metals, and uh, gold's interesting because gold finally went above 2000 and uh, even though lots of people were saying that's temporary, it's going to drop back, it hasn't yet. As of this recording, we're still over 2000 Meanwhile, cryptocurrency has taken a big downslide. You know, Bitcoin's dipped under 40 after being almost at 50 in less than three weeks. So there's so much going on. How do you know you don't? And the secret is you just got to pay attention and maybe this year pay attention a little more often. Had a chance uh, a few weeks back to sit down with our good friend Ken McElroy and muse a little about what we're expecting to see in 2024. Not only is he a sharp guy, but his record speaks for itself. When we come back, you'll meet our good friend and best-selling author, Ken McElroy today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. As I speak, inflation is robbing you at a rate north of 10%. Last year, the number one zip code that Mid-South Homebuyers offered income property to Real Estate Guys listeners in appreciated by 21%. To harness that spread and protect and grow your wealth in the current economic storm, you need the two decades of experience in renovation and management that Mid-South Homebuyers brings to their investors. Every home Mid-South offers you will have brand new components, a new 30-year roof, and a high-quality renter, all in a price range under $150,000. Their empathetic property managers will use your ROI as their North Star, while the lack of repairs on their totally renovated properties contributes to their almost four-year average renter stay and 99% occupancy rate. Learn about their lifetime occupancy guarantee and total one-year maintenance guarantee by emailing midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's MidSouth at realestateguysradio.com. You'll be glad you did. 
Hi, this is Mauricio Raul, the founder and CEO of Mere Law Group, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. We're now in our 28th year of broadcast. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona today, catching up with our good friend, real estate entrepreneur and best-selling author, Ken McElroy. Kenny, great to have you back on the program. Great to be on. There is a ton going on in the world, in the economy, in real estate, and this time of year, everyone wants to know, what's the future look like? So I've dusted off my crystal ball, and Kenny, I know you've done the same. And what we want to talk about today is 2024, what the promises might be, what the challenges might be, headwinds, tailwinds, and what should real estate investors be paying attention to? Sure. Well, I think the first thing that people need to wrap their head around is obviously the cost of debt, interest rates, cost of equity, you know, what everybody uses, whether you're raising money from somebody or you're borrowing it from somebody, there's a cost. Yeah. Those costs are up. So how far are they going to go down or are they going to go down or are they going to keep going up? So that's kind of the big thing because those numbers have to be figured out before you can do anything. Everything has to pencil, the math has to work. What I tell everybody is if you take a look at what happened through 2022 and 2023, if you're looking at interest rate increases and each increase with, let's say, 25% basis points or 0.25, yeah. there were 21 of those over 11 times. So there were 21 rate increases of at least 0.25 or more. So what does that mean? What that means is that interest rates are significantly higher in a two-year period. That's all that means. And so a lot of people are hanging on the fact that rates might go down. And I'm like, okay, well, 21 times? Because the Fed, as it starts ratcheting down, is not going to do 75 or 50 basis points. They're going to do 25. So maybe they do two, three, four rate reductions next year. Maybe. Well, what does that really mean? Really nothing. That's not going to move the needle at all. In right. fact, it'll probably create more of an asset bubble again, which is how we got into this mess. Well, this is a really interesting point because depending on perspective, if you've only invested the last five or 10 years, like you're thinking, well, what happened? I mean, I was getting loans at two and three and 4%. You made a really interesting comment to me when you were at our syndication event a few months back. You said, you know, we, we've been investing about the same amount of time. We're almost the same age. And we're almost the same person on the Colby desk, but that's a different story. And, and you said, you know, Robert, during the time you and I have been investing, uh, the average interest rate we've seen is higher than the interest rate today. Correct. Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that. So if you came in the game in the last 10 years, you've seen nothing but this. Right. And so that's actually the flaw or the bias or the blinders that you have on. But if you've been around it long enough to realize that this is actually what I think is going to be the new normal going forward. So the Fed is always going to use the interest rates to go down and up, depending on what they need to do in the economy. But at the end of the day, if they go down too far, it's going to create another inflationary time, which is exactly what they're fighting. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. So I think people need to realize they need to survive the 25. And then they need to figure out how can they buy in that new economy at these new rates. And that is really the big question. So it's not just that rates went up, like you mentioned. In the latter part of those raises, they went up so quick. So when we talk about the Federal Reserve, the rate that's set by the Fed is not the same as the interest rate on your home. But your interest rate is influenced by that because of the capital market makers. So not to get too in the weeds and wonky about this, what we look at on a practical point of view is when we are looking at a house or an apartment building or a commercial center, whatever it is, we're going to look for our capital stack, all the money that's required, and that's going to be debt and equity. And there can be different tranches of debt and equity depending on the deal. And the debt piece is really dependent upon the credit markets. So when interest rates go up and they go by a lot, it affects the amount you have to pay every month. So no secret that if you bought a house four years ago, you're sitting on a pretty good interest rate and there's an excellent chance that you would be hesitant to sell the house, not because you wouldn't have a reason to, but because you don't want to let go of that loan. Right. So let's say you lived in a $500,000 home and you had a hundred or $200,000 of equity and you had a rate of four. 
which is the majority of America, yeah. let's just say. You're not going to move into another $500,000 home and have the same payment next door. You're going to have a lot higher payment. Your payment is going to be at least two to two and a half percent higher right now. So you're not going to do that. That's another thousand dollars a month, let's say. So you're going to stay where you are. And so that's actually keeping a lot of people in the situation that they're in, which you can't blame them. At the same time, home prices aren't really going down. Right. That's the interesting thing. So home prices are actually still rising in many areas. That's because the supply of homes is also not coming. There's there's not a normalcy back on the number of listings that typically come into the marketplace to neutralize it. If you look at historically, the amount of listings in MLS, let's say, it's somewhere between four and six months is about right. That's yeah. about the time it takes to sell a home. Four to six months, I think that's been about normal. They, yep. So if you were to, let's say, a kitchen sink, and say that four to six months, you had a full kitchen sink of water, and that's that would be completely full of, at four to six months. With the faucet being new listings and the drain being sales, right now we're sitting at about 50% full. Yeah. So the sink is about 50% full. So the problem is actually inventory on the market. That's actually what's keeping prices high. Yeah less inventory and that's how real estate is priced. When you have more sellers than you have buyers, then prices are going to go down. When you have more buyers and sellers, prices are going to get up, all things being equal. But now you've got far less inventory, less water in the sink than you've had. And the rate, the drip of the faucet is hardly any. There's just right. aren't that many people putting, even new home builders. So when we talk about single family, uh, there's new inventory. And let's face it, we're behind on on housing units in the U.S. So there are builders who are getting to work, putting together, you know, whether it's uh, houses or townhouses or apartment buildings, uh, they're putting uh, new units in the ground because we have a demand for that. But then you have existing supply and existing supply has always been the bigger number. But because of the sink scenario, there are actually more newer homes percentage wise right now available than there have been in the past. Yeah, and part of that is because those projects got started a couple of years ago. So back when things were a little more normal, mostly interest rates and the cost, like cost to build, you know, the roof tiles and the framing and the sheetrock and the concrete and all the appliances and all those things were less. So when you started something two years ago, it's definitely gone up in price, as has the debt. So construction debt is somewhere around eight, nine, ten percent right now. Yeah. Okay, so it's double from where it was. So all of those things, if you're a builder or you're trying to build an apartment building or a house or whatever it is, you actually are pausing going, you know, the math doesn't work now. So you're actually going to finish what you're doing. But then from there, there's a big drop off in, in supply coming. You're, you're going to see everything that's going to be built is going to be completed and absorbed, I think, through 2024 and early 2025, but the end of 25, middle to 25 and 26, and even possibly 27, we're going to have a massive supply problem. Yeah. So prediction-wise, 2024, what's your best guess on interest rates? Interest rates are going to be somewhere between 6 and 7%. I, I do think the Fed's going to bring them down a little bit, two, three, four. Again, it doesn't really matter how many times because they're going to do it at a quarter point. So maybe they go from 7.5 to 6.5 or a six. Again, it doesn't matter because over 80% of America is sitting underneath 5% with equity and they're not going to do anything until it comes way down. Again, back to that 21 increases at, at a quarter point each. Actually, 11 increases, but 21 times at a quarter point each. That's how far it's gone. So just four or five times down the ladder, right. it's not going to move the needle at all. Yep. I'm going to totally agree. If you're waiting for interest rates to get back into the threes and fours, you're going to be waiting quite a while. Now, let's talk about inventory. Do we see anything on the horizon for next year that's going to change the amount of water in the sink? So I don't think so. That's actually the interesting thing. It's typically like in 08, the water was pouring out of the faucet like crazy 
and inventory was spilling over in the sink and that's when things went out of balance. That's actually needed. That actually is what corrects pricing. Yeah. We saw a lot of distress. And all of a sudden, right. property was coming to the market, yep. prices were going down. Thoughtful investors, we were out buying and the rest of the world was saying, are you crazy? I remember the days when you guys would go in and there was no best and final. You were the only off. Yeah. And you were picking up great stuff when everyone else was scared to death. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now in hindsight, you know, at the time you didn't realize, you know, what you had, right? right. Now you look back and you go, oh, man, I wish I would have doubled up uh, during that period of time. But the truth is, I don't think we're heading there next. You, you know, again, first you have to fill the sink up. Yeah. And that the only way that that's going to happen is if people want to get out of their homes and rates come down and they have the equity, right? Yeah. So uh, I don't see that happening at all. So I see rates somewhere in the 6 to 7%. I see a lot of distress in the commercial markets, you know, specifically office. Yeah. And um, multifamily, the syndicators are in trouble, as we all know. Not all of them, but some of them, the undercapitalized ones. If you bought anything in the last two years... There's no question, whatever you bought is 30% less in value. So, but it, it's not meaningful unless you have to sell yeah. or unless the investors want their money back or the equity uh, or the debt or equity wants their money back. So it's not that big of a deal, but if you could ride it out and wait. But I think the real big issue is going to be next year, it's going to be the time to buy. And here's why I believe so. There's a tremendous amount of supply hitting the market, mostly on the multifamily side. So these are projects that started a couple of years ago. And by the way, I've got a number of those too. Yeah. So we're in lease up, we're in development, we're in construction. So when I tell you that costs are going up and I tell you that interest rates are going up, it's because I feel it personally in my own company. These are not theories. And all my friends that are in the space, same issue. So we're all concerned about all that. But rents are also going up. And so you'll read that we have this big supply problem and that rents are going down. And that is true in one respect, but it's not true. They're just not going up as fast as they were. Yeah, this is a tricky one. When yeah. you talk about rent growth is declining, it's still growing. It's not going up as fast. Yeah. So it's hard to get your mind around. It's like disinflation versus deflation, right? Two different things. So uh, let's talk about commercial because I think this is something that we've talked about on your show, on my show, the fact that if you are a single family home investor, you're used to the idea that you can refinance pretty much whenever it makes sense. Right now, probably not an idea, uh, but it certainly was during those times that Ken mentioned the rates going up. You know, Beck, there was that time of, uh, that we'd wake up, get a cup of coffee, refinance the mortgage, right? Because rates were going down every, every day, it seemed. But with commercial, it's not like that. Commercial loans are for a longer period of time. And so what we have is a couple things working against us in especially office. We have the fact that there is less demand for office space. Some companies have figured out post COVID that, you know what, we can get by with at least some of our workforce being at home uh, and not being at the office. And the second thing that's happened is because of that and the financing side, uh, lease rates are down in a lot of places. So now follow us on this. There's clearly distress in the commercial markets because People don't need as much space and they don't pay as much for it. It doesn't show up right away. And it doesn't show up right away because many of these leases are still valid. They leased in 2018 and it was a five-year lease. So they're just now coming up for renewal. And that means that even though perhaps the company in the space was not using all the space, they still had to pay for it. And the owner of the property could then take that money and pay the mortgage. So the mortgage isn't showing distress but it's about to. Yeah, it's called shadow vacancy. So so like, let's say I have 10,000 feet somewhere and I only now need five. I'm yep. paying for 10. And so when I renew, I'm going to get five. And you're probably going to negotiate the rate down. Correct, right. So, so what happens is there's a tremendous amount of sublease space actually happening right now. So if you really, and, and it's actually a big, big number. There, I just did a podcast on this about all the sublease space. That future vacancy is a great way to think about that. So if you're a commercial owner or commercial, you're in commercial leasing, you got to be shaking in your boots right. because not only are you trying to fill vacancy, rates are going down. 
but you're also trying to fill subleases for guys like me because I'm going to that same group and say, hey, can you rent another two, three thousand feet in my office? I'm not really using it. Or maybe I'm not using it at all and I'm paying for it. So there's lots of that too. So there are people that are actually paying for 10,000 square feet and not even going there anymore. But at the moment, the mortgage is in distress and the landlord is in distress, but we're going to see more of that. Now, also, there are trillions of dollars of loans that are going to have to be refied that today are might maybe four or three and a half or commercial loans. And there's no choice in those loans, but to either pay them off or refinance them. That's the other piece. Let's say you're the lender and I'm at a 4% interest rate and my loans do. Well, I'm going to go to you with the same building with higher vacancy, yeah, higher expenses too. We haven't even talked about that. Lower income. Lower income and higher expenses. And I'm going to go to you and say, I need a loan. And you're going to size up my deal based on 7%. Right. At 7% or 60% LTV or loan to value. Whereas maybe that loan before was 80% at 4%, 80% loan to value at 4%. So we're also seeing lower leverage, and but the values have come down. So, you know, so that's really the big problem facing a lot of these commercial folks is they for sure have value problems in what they purchase, especially if they bought in the last two or three years. But the values are, have come down a lot, and that's precisely because interest rates are up. So as far as prediction for 2024, I think we're going to see some of that distressed inventory at the market. We've already seen some of it, right? Everyone heard about the office building in San Francisco that sold for 30 70. cents on the dollars or whatever it was. It was 75,000. Oh, 75, 75 million. It was in the close to 300 yeah. at one point. Yeah. The Wells well, Fargo building, I think it was. Yeah. So that's obviously, but they're all over the place like that. They're sneaky. You know, I don't know why you would buy, I call it catching a falling knife. You know, it's, it's, we don't know how far this is going to go. Right. Right. Because the work from home thing is, is still a deal. Yeah. Now, depending on the industry, of course, it's hard to have some jobs uh, work from home, but there, there are a bunch of folks that are happy doing it. It's bringing costs down. It's quality of life. It's all those things. So that's probably a trend we'll continue to watch. We're in sunny Arizona talking with Ken McElroy about the things real estate investors need to follow in 2024. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Garrett Sutton, Robert Kiyosaki's asset protection attorney and the author of Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. As an American or foreign-based investor in U.S. real estate, you know we are a litigious society. You know that you need to protect your real estate, paper, and bullion holdings with the right mix of LLCs and corporations. Our firm, Corporate Direct, not only forms these entities, but importantly, we properly maintain them too. If you fail to follow the corporate formalities, you can lose it all in an instant. Corporate Direct is your source for LLC protection and maintenance in all 50 states. Visit CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention the Real Estate Guys for a free bonus. That's 800-600-1760 or CorporateDirect.com. We look forward to assisting you at CorporateDirect.com. Having trouble finding deals where the numbers make sense? Invest in an asset class that delivers cash flow to you in good times and bad, and where most of that cash flow is tax-free. I'm Dave Zook. Many of you have heard me speak at Real Estate Guys events or heard me on their podcast. My team is a top five ATM operator in the country, and right now accredited investors can make cash flow returns well into the double digits and get huge tax deductions. For your free report on this lucrative asset class, email atm at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Dennis Waitley, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Hey, make plans to join us at the 22nd Annual Investor Summit at Sea. We spend a couple of days in a hotel in beautiful Florida, then jump on an awesome cruise ship and visit Aruba, Bon Air, and Curacao, and on our sea days, hang out with the most incredible faculty, folks like our guest Ken McElroy, 
George Gammon, Jason Hartman, sales legend Tommy Hopkins, Brian London, Dana Samuelson, and Peter Schiff, plus a bunch more. You need to be there. To get all the details, just send an email to summit at realestateguysradio.com, summit at realestateguysradio.com, or go to investorsummit at c.com. We're at the Ken McElroy Studios today talking about the things we're paying attention to in the real estate sectors for 2024. Before we get back to that, it's time to play real estate trivia, your chance to win a prize by knowing today's real estate trivia question. When you hear the question and think you know the answer, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. First person with the right guess gets Kenny's latest book, The ABCs of Buying Rental Property by Ken McElroy. That could be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week, we asked this, which country has the lowest average elevation? Well, the answer is the Maldives, averaging just one and a half meters above sea level, followed by Tuvalu, Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, and Singapore. Sounds like I have friends in low elevation places. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Name the U.S. state with the highest cost of living. Yeah, which state in the U.S. does it cost the most to live in? If you know or want to guess, or maybe you live there, send your answer to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, the answer to the question, and your physical mailing address. The first person that gets it right gets a copy of the ABCs of Buying Rental Property by Ken McElroy. That's today's real estate trivia question. Kenny, there's a lot to watch in 2024. Let's talk about expenses because there was that period of time where everything in the construction business was 2X, 3X, 4X. I know you guys went through this. We went through this with just lumber and materials and just ev everything that goes into components of building. That's softened up a little bit. Are you seeing that? A little bit. Well, one goes up, apparently doesn't come down. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I would like... You know, I was waiting. I'm waiting for these costs to come down. You know, the interesting thing is, too, if you own a commercial building, there's something inside of your lease called a CPI increase. So the costs get passed through to the tenant. Yes, sir. that's another piece. So, you know, there's that, too. So the, the landlords, whether you're office or industrial or retail or multi-valley, you're getting tagged with higher property taxes, yeah. higher insurance, higher utilities higher, you know, commodities, higher labor, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I just told a story the other day, you know, our insurance costs for one year for our portfolio is just over $3 million. That's what we pay as a company. Yeah. So we went out to bid and the insurance business is, is getting hammered. It's getting clobbered right now for lots of reasons. But uh, our best renewal after shopping the heck out of it is $4 million. So our insurance went from three million to four million, let's say. So a little over a thirty percent increase, and that's the same properties with no losses. So you know those are things that are real. You know they start to make themselves through the properties you know, into the expenses, and they start to reduce the returns to the investors, and they start to reduce the cash flow on these assets, and that's just one thing. So, you know, it's a full-on battle to manage expenses right now. You know, I just saw a panel discussion on insurance, a bunch of insurance carriers, insurance brokers, and insurance attorney. And this was hard for me to get because I see the insurance side and our policy is up. We have a policy that's up $400,000. And that money has to come from somewhere. That's just a hard cost. You, you don't go to your tenant and say, oh, you know, insurance has gone up. Can you, can you add another $22 a month? I mean, that's not how it works. Eventually, those costs work their way into the rents, but that takes some time. Anyway, their premise was the insurance companies aren't making any money. They haven't just jacked up rates because they want to you know, have nicer cars. They're actually in trouble. They are. And, and so so what's what I, I had a friend that owned an insurance company. Here's what he said. He goes, we've never paid any claims. I go, what are you talking about? He's like, we just build it into next year's premiums. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You know, so whatever your losses are, we build it into the premiums for, you know, to the following year. So 
So what's happened is apparently with the hurricanes and all the storms they had in the southeast and then the fires in Hawaii and a bunch of other things, they've had massive losses. So yep. think about if you're State Farm, right? State Farm is probably worldwide. They're certainly national. So if you have a home in Florida and you have a home in Arizona and you're, you know, so, so, you know, so they're looking at their losses company-wide. So that's how I've had it explained to me is the, the they've had losses in areas and other areas are fine, but they spread it through the whole system. They also, our insurance companies are always worried about risk and managing and mitigating risk. And it used to be that an insurance company would love to take your brand new development of 200 homes. But now that's too much risk for them in one place. They might take 40 of the homes. They don't want to take all the homes anymore. So you are seeing those situations. So I think our prediction for 2024 is just insurance is going to be harder and more expensive and start earlier. I mean, I remember the day we, you know, we used to close at our property and then the closing agent would say, oh, do you have an insurance binder? And we go, oh, we call the insurance guy and it was faxed over. Now it's not like that. So this this year, I think you got to start early when it comes. Don't, don't assume you're going to be able to get a policy that you can live with. Go figure out the cost before you get to the closing table. Did you say faxed? Faxed, yeah. It was faxed. It was come over. That, well, before over. that, it would be a guy with a stone <laughs> tablet. That's how long I've been yeah. in real estate business. The, the, but. Uh, yeah. And the other thing I think, the, the next big piece for 2024 that's going to be something that everyone's going to be talking about um, are property taxes. So do you think about just... Let's pick on a city. Uh, let's pick on San Francisco. Might as well pick on that one. Easy to pick on. So you think about all the commerce that happens in a city like that. You know, go into town, get a cup of coffee, go break, go get some lunch, go have a beer afterwards. You're go, you know, you're parking your car, you're tipping people, all that stuff. Okay, that's very different today. Okay, yeah. so all the tax all the stuff, all the things that used to be there to be able to fund a city like that are severely impacted, okay? So their revenue is way down. Yeah. These these urban core cities are really, really hurt. This Portland, this Seattle, this San Francisco as an example. And so what pays all that? Property tax. So the low-hanging fruit is going to be real estate landlords um, and so the problem is, is that is just going to get make it worse for those buildings that are already 30 and 40% vacant with no tenants. But they're now going to see next year, I believe, the property tax increases because those services are needed. Though Those property taxes are needed to be able to pay, to be able to fund those kinds of things. So I think that's the next lag in the, in the ring uh, that we're going to see next year. Yeah, you know, depending on where you are in the country, property tax is all over the, the map, right? I moved from California to Texas, and the property tax rate doubled. But the cost of the house was cut in half. So it's always compared to what? And when you run the numbers, it's one of the things about investors. We don't get emotionally attached. We aren't worried about which way the sun comes in the window, right? We're looking at what our costs are, what our revenue is, what we expect it to be. So we're always looking forward. And I would say that when it comes to a lot of these expenses, uh, you're going to want to get your your mind ar around that because if expenses go up, there's only one place for that to come from. Yeah, that's the thing. So uh, expense management is going to be the big thing for 2024. And uh, we were already starting and we're, we're, we're literally going line item by line item. We're looking at every single thing as you always should be. But as you know, when things are growing and you're, you know, you're building an empire and all those kinds of things... Sometimes you don't do those, but now it's the time to do that. You need to make sure that your operating expenses are perfect and that your revenue is perfect and that your net operating income, which is expenses or income minus expenses, is perfect. Then when you get in a position, you have to go to a bank or you need more money or you need to bring in another equity partner. At least the management of whatever you have is perfect. And that's what I suggest to everybody, that's where you need to be for 2024. Now, Kerry, let's talk about the tenant's perspective because everyone is familiar with what's happened in inflation. You've been to the gas pump, you've been to the grocery store, and even though inflation has come down, it's not that there's negative inflation, it's that it's not as high as it was, but it really impacts tenants, right? I know when you pull up the gas pump, if gas is up a dollar, you might grumble for a minute, but it's not going to affect whether or not you put gas in your car. 
If gas goes up a dollar, most of our tenants are going to make decisions because of that impact to their household budget. Yeah, we're starting to see that. You know, we're starting to see people cut back on other things, and, and they do. You, you know, drive less. That's why work. For, that's another piece of work from home. You bet. You know, believe it or not, if 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 somebody comes into the office three days a week versus five, then that extra two days on a commute adds up over time, especially over a year. Yeah. So there are other pieces that you got to consider. But I think, you know, one of the things, uh, obviously, food is incredibly expensive. You know, not you know, obviously gas. You know, these are these are things that I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel on. Yeah, unfortunately, it's the new it's the new reality. Um, now, speaking of new reality, and by the way, it's not all bad news. Uh, we're just trying to warn you, right? And nothing makes us right. We've just been in the business a long time, and we're guessing on some of this stuff. But I would call these educated guesses because so you're talking to people, I'm talking to people. Uh, let's talk about one of the big topics that is kind of global and overarching and how it might fit in to actually help the real estate business, and that's artificial intelligence. Everyone's talking about AI, and there's been versions of this for a long time, but we're really starting to see it impact real estate. What are your thoughts along those lines? Well, I think what happens is when you start to see these costs go up in other areas that maybe you took for granted, you start to look for other areas to save. And unfortunately, that's going to be on the labor side. Yeah. That's the downside of some of these inflationary things because whatever you own, even if it's just a home or a, or a small business or a big business, it doesn't really matter. As your costs go up and it doesn't match your income, you're going to start to look for things to cut. And AI is a layup in so many ways. You know, one to obviously generate revenue because that's another way to to tackle higher expenses is to figure out a way to grow more revenue. I actually love hanging out there more than I do on the expense side. But on the other side of it, you know, there's going to be lots and lots of things around that. You know, think about for just assistance or or accounting or legal. You know, there's all kinds of stuff right now already that are making a lot of high paid people, you know, um, obsolete, you know, and they say that AI is really taking a big shot at white collar more than blue collar. Yeah. So, so white collar is actually really taking it in the chin, mostly. Yeah. I The irony is, is that the blue collar is actually where all the demand is. That's, if you want to look at wage growth, it's there. You know, the trades people, they're not coming up. You know, the folks that, like my dad was a journeyman plumber, you know, like that kind of stuff. You know, over time he was making, he made pretty good money and made a really, really good living. Those people aren't going into the into those jobs right now. And so what's happening is, you know, you're seeing 50, 75, even hundred dollars an hour for that kind of work. And, you know, I think that's awesome, you know, because for the longest time they were underpaid. So this is interesting. AI is taking a shot at white collar. Um, at the same time, if if you need somebody, there's no way to use AI. Right. right. If so, you need somebody to come to your house to fix something. Fix your plumbing. Or build something. You can't do that with AI. So right. this is the rise of the blue collar time, I think. And you're going to see that in 2024. Let's talk about pockets of opportunity. So we're going to have to sharpen our pencil. We're going to pay close attention to expenses. Market selection is going to be important. Where do you think some of the opportunity might be in 2024? Well, I always tell people that real estate doesn't work if there aren't people there. And, and I think people lose sight of that, like the very obvious thing, but you'd be surprised how many people find something, they read something, they go somewhere, and then they get emotionally attached to buying it. And, you know, they ignore all the red flags, you know, they're everywhere. So I think you really got to pay attention to uh, migration patterns still. So what are migration patterns? That's if, um, if, somebody, rents a, if somebody rents a U-Haul truck in Seattle and moves to Phoenix, that's a data point. Yeah. You know, that tells you it's a one-way trip, right? Um, and so this, this data is everywhere. You know, out-of-state driver's licenses, North American van lines, United, all those different companies have data points. And you can kind of see where people are moving. It's not exact. It's not great. The other one is cell phones. So like one of the interesting things is they, they can actually see like cell phone use in an urban core which is very interesting. So think about why that might be important. If cell phone use 
in downtown San Francisco is down 50%. That tells you that there's 50% less people, more than likely. Okay, so all of that stuff's important. If you start to look at all this stuff, you, like I love to see, you know, then you can kind of make really good guesses and educated uh, guesses on where do you think you should be investing. So still, obviously, the winners are the the low cost states. You know, affordability is a big deal. Weather is a big deal. The winners are still Florida. They're still Texas, largely. They're still North Carolina, Tennessee, and uh, Arizona are kind of where a lot of people are going. Not the only places, of course, but um, you know, we're starting to see big busts in areas like Boise that was on fire before yep. and. Um, and then anything that has a barrier to entry. So, you know, what would that look like? So that might be uh, a geographic, uh, p- perhaps, or it could be, um, you, know, you know, a city that says we don't want any building here. And, um, you know, there's a population boom or something like that. So so there's all these little nuances that um, you, you need to look at. But those are the states we're focusing on. And then I think the other thing I'd add to that is just tenant landlord law. So every state has different uh, tenant landlord law. There are states that are more friendly to tenants and there's states that are more friendly to landlords. Personally, I'd rather own property in a state that's more friendly to landlords, which happened to be some of the states you mentioned, by the way. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I I, I don't think I ever really paid that much attention to my governors. Yeah. But man, this pandemic, COVID, all these new policies coming out and and, the things that they're doing. You have to pay attention to that because they're like, uh, I'll just pick on Oregon, for example. You know, Oregon went statewide rent control. Right. So, okay. So the question is, is would you still invest? there? And you might. But what that means is that they're going to cap your income, your potential yep. income. So if you want to invest there and that state says that you can only grow your rents a certain amount of time, you know, knock yourself out. On the same token... They're also going to bump your utilities and bump your property taxes and bump your insurance and all that stuff. So if you want your rent capped and your or your potential income capped and your expenses, you're you're going to get sandwiched. And, and so, so what's happening is, as you know, money goes where it's treated best. Yeah. So all of a sudden, oh, well, let's let's just let's take a right turn and maybe we'll go to Nevada because money has a choice. And so, so that's what we're starting to see. And I asked a good friend of mine who's at a huge investment banking. I said, where are you investing your money? He said, right now we're staying off the coasts. I thought that was interesting. And we're looking inward, you know, so now that's a real general answer, but, um, you know, blue, red, who knows? So, uh, let's leave you with some green shoots. There is some good news in, in all of this. First of all, the basic premise of real estate is that somebody else gets up every day and goes to work, not for you. Uh, you don't manage them, but they send a big chunk of their paycheck to you so you can pay all of your expenses and your mortgage. And if you do it right, you never pay the mortgage payment the tenant does, and then you have a free and clear property. So I don't see a technology coming down the pike that's going to eliminate the need for human beings to sleep under a roof. And we're underbuilt as a nation in the United States, and this is true in other countries as well. We've not kept up because of all the myriad reasons we've not kept up with demand. So depending on who you listen to, uh, folks like uh, the home builders have a different opinion than folks like the realtors, but everyone thinks we're a million or three million or five million, some number of units underbuilt, which means the housing is going to stay constricted. So there will be opportunity. There actually is now, you know, you, you know, you're going to, if you're reading the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and it says that there's a million units entering the market right now, and and, and that's all you're going to do, then you're probably going to stop. But if you dig a little bit deeper and realize that that reporter doesn't know shit about real estate, and they're making a big, broad, blanket statement, it might not even be accurate, and you start to dig a little bit deeper, you're going to realize that there are areas that are very vibrant and great, great great places to invest. And that's how the rich get richer. That's how people make profit. And that's how people get through these times because times are tough right now. If you're thinking of real estate as a national economy, then that's your first mistake. Yeah. All real estate is local. 
Now, here's something you absolutely can do in 2024. Sharpen the saw. Continue to get educated. Get your news from reliable sources, people that have earned the right to have an opinion. And lots of voices are great, right? I know I listen to a lot of podcasts. You listen to a lot of podcasts. We have lots of people in our network that we're asking these questions, getting these conversations. And I think this is an excellent season. Uh, If you can't be in every market and if it doesn't make sense to pull the trigger, you don't want to catch that falling knife, you can really devote some time to operational efficiency, following those expenses and making sure you get them down, and then educating yourself. Because the other thing is there will be less competition when it's not obvious. Thankfully. Right? So we're going to see those times where there's less competition. That's actually what I'm waiting for. If you look at a bunch of goofballs that got into real estate, you know, they're raising money, they're getting their real estate licenses. I'm not saying they shouldn't, but the real estate people have boomed. You know, the real estate syndicators have boomed. The amount of people raising money have boomed. Right or wrong, the cracks will start to show up. They already are. So if you're in a good position, you have the right team, the right wisdom, the right experience, this is going to be your time. On that, we definitely agree. As usual, Kenny, it's been great batting these ideas around. To hear more from Ken, be sure to subscribe to his Real Estate Strategies podcast at all your favorite podcast outlets. If you'd like to hang out with Ken for a week in June, then join us for the 22nd Annual Investor Summit at Sea. To get the details and reserve your spot, go to Investor's Summit at Sea. Dot com. That's Investorsummit at sea.com. Thanks, Kenny, for your gracious hospitality and sharing your wisdom with us. As always, buddy. There's Ken McElroy. You can learn more at kenmcelroy.com. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. All aboard. Registration is open for the Real Estate Guys 22nd Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending more than a week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning in 2024 is the editor of the Gold Newsletter, Brian London, real estate developer Beth Clifford, and the rebel capitalist George Gammon. Back with us in 2024, sales legend and best-selling author Tom Hopkins. And joining us live and in person for his 12th Investor Summit, Ken McElroy. Plus two brand new faculty members we can't even mention yet, and a lot more. It all begins June 13th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Visit investorsummitatc.com to get all the details and reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to investorsummitatc.com and make plans to spend a week with the real estate guys, Ken McElroy, Tom Hawkins, and an all-star faculty on the 22nd annual Investor Summit at Sea. Hi, this is Kim Kiyosaki. I'm the author of Rich Woman, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. We're glad you've tuned in today. We'd even be happier to see you at our upcoming event, The Secrets of Successful Syndication. Happens near the end of March in Dallas, Texas. If you've ever thought about maybe putting together a real estate fund or a bigger deal that takes more capital, or you're a passive investor thinking about finding those kinds of great deals, then come on out. You get all the details by sending an email to syndication at realestateguysradio.com. Well, my goodness, it is always good to hear from Kenny McElroy. Well, yeah. I mean, we just got done talking about syndication and that's Kenny's game. Kenny goes out and uh, finds great deals and aggregates capital, shares those deals with investors who are eager to put their capital to work. He's been doing a great job for many, many years. I don't know how many billions of dollars of assets he has under management. I know it's a multiple billions. And he has been through a lot of up and down markets. And it's really interesting because I think that there's going to be some people in the syndication space uh, that are going to be shaken out because some of the things that happened over the last couple of years with COVID and the interest rates and people who only were geared for sunshine had never invested through a down market uh, are, are being caught a little bit flat-footed. That's why. And in professionals too, that's why you're seeing 
uh, even commercial real estate trusts and, and commercial real estate loans and big players are struggling right now. And so some people are like, why in the world would I want to get into syndication in a market like this? But Ken is actually super excited. Yeah, I was talking to him the other day. Saying, I'm licking my chops. This is fantastic. I've been waiting years for this because this market has been way too overheated. It's sad for the people who are going to get shaken out. But it's a huge opportunity for the people who know what they're doing to step in and the capital that wants to go along for that ride. And that's really what syndication is all about. And so Kenny spends a lot of time paying attention to the things we've been talking about on the show today so that he can form good uh, investment theses and form good investment strategy, pick the right markets uh, where he feels that they, you have the best opportunity for migration and rents and increases and all of that. Plus, he has to manage the debt and pay attention to the future of interest rates and take precautions or take advantage of the situations as they change. And so he spends a lot of time watching the horizon and listening to macro guys and talking to his property managers and getting the word on the street and everything in between. And so um, these things directly all relate. And that's why it's so fun to talk to Kenny because he really does help put the pieces of the puzzle together. Well, he sure does. It was great hanging out with him at Create Your Future. He brought both of his boys to the Goals Retreat for the second year in a row. And we also had a surprise appearance on Saturday night by the collective inner circle, Jason Hartman, George Gammon, and Kenny, and you and I, and uh, super excited about this new initiative. Just started January 1st, but our high, high, high level mastermind with these five folks, that is uh, just a great way to stay connected and watch how different people are processing the information. Yeah, these are business people and investors that have pretty good sized portfolios, pretty good size incomes, and they're the captains of those ventures. And they need to look down the horizon and make good strategic decisions in time to take advantage of opportunity or avoid risk. Tax code is changing, interest rates, credit markets are changing, there's policies being made, how does that trickle down to Main Street? And if you think about it, the cost of admission isn't cheap, but compared to what? Right. Right. Just one great idea. I, I talked to a guy, he goes, you know, I, I can, and I got into a conversation, he told me about interest rates, the direction of interest rates and strategy for organizing the debt in your portfolio to withstand what was coming. Yeah. And the guy took his advice and restructured his portfolio. He said it saved him a hundred thousand dollars. And of course you and I've had Brad Sumrock on the show. And so we're not talking out of school, but he had a conversation with Ken and Ken shared with him a tax tip and reduced Brad's income tax by a million dollars a year. And, and that is a benefit that just continues to accrue every year he puts those strategies in place. So sometimes people look at being involved in these, the time commitment and the financial commitment. They're like, I don't know if it's worth it. You know, I, I don't know. I, I can tell you the folks that are in it are getting value. And there's a reason why people who like Ken and George and Jason, who really don't need the money uh, and to spend the time to do it, it, it's really what we learn from each other and the conversations we have. And when people come in with their hard questions and we all have to sit down and try to figure out how to get them unstuck like a true mastermind would or to discuss what's coming and prepare presentations, it just causes us all to be sharper. George is a macro guy. He looks at the big picture. If you're not following George Gammon on georgegammon.com, you should. Famous for his whiteboard videos and explaining the financial system. Jason's been a Main Street real estate investor, a residential real estate for as long as we've been around. Around. I mean, just forever. And he really understands that market well. Obviously, we talked to Ken today and understand where he's coming from and what he's all about. And uh, I've actually learned to be pretty fluent in precious metals and the dollar and the bond market and how all that works. And of course, you've been uh, in this game a long, long time and have interviewed some of the brightest people in the space. So you put all that brain power together and rub our brains together for a couple of days, four times a year. Good, good, good stuff happens. So I couldn't be more excited about it. Yeah, the Collective Inner Circle meets physically four times a year. And then every month we have all kinds of calls and interactions. Each partner hosts a call. It's good, good stuff. If you'd like more information, about what that might look like for you, just send an email to collective at realestateguysradio.com, collective at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, big thanks to Ken McElroy for sharing his big brain with us today. We've got a couple of awesome interviews coming up. Can't wait for you to hear. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by... 
Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at BeYourBank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.